Wir haben uns entschieden, hier mal das ähm, Logo der UN zum Internationalen Frauentag zu nehmen. Und ich hatte schon vorher gesagt, es ist immer so ein bisschen hin und her. Sollen wir einen Frauentag machen? Ist es noch nötig? Und ja, es ist noch nötig. Äh, Gender Equality for Sustainable Tomorrow ist das Motto diesen Jahres. Und ich freue mich ganz doll, dass wir viele weibliche Sprecher heute haben. Wir haben Frau Antonitsch gleich von unserem Generalkonsulat in San Francisco, die dafür für Wissenschaften zuständig ist. Danach wird äh, Joanne Halpern, die die meisten, die in der Lecture Series oft teilnehmen, schon kennen, aus New York vom HPI, die uns hier immer hilft zu organisieren, äh, unsere Sprecherin für heute vorstellen. Und unsere Sprecherin ist Katharina Mandel. Darauf freue ich mich ganz besonders, denn Katharina ist die Erfinderin der Luca-App. Und wir haben schon vorher kurz ein bisschen erzählt. Und Katharina kennt auch Men's Planning aus eigener Erfahrung. Und äh, auch das wird vielleicht auch mal ein Thema sein zum Frauen. Da sonst geht es aber ganz inhaltlich heute um IT, wie so oft, wenn wir unsere HPI Lecture Series haben. Und ähm, da kann ich gar nicht anders als noch mal erwähnen, dass wir vor anderthalb Jahren zu meiner vollen Überraschung, als ich ganz neu hier war als Schulleitung, eine, eine amerikanische Auszeichnung kriegen, kriegten für unseren ähm, IT-Kurs, weil da mehr Mädchen als Jungs drin waren oder mehr Frauen als Männer. Und da dachte ich, das ist ja eine ulke, ulke Urkunde oder eine ulke Belobigung. Aber es ist natürlich toll und wir hatten auch im letzten Jahr ja unsere ersten Abiturienten im Fach Informatik. Und wie ihr vielleicht gehört habt, hat da eine Abiturientin die erste Prüfung gemacht und hat auch 15 Punkte gekriegt. Also so wie es sein soll im Silicon Valley. Wie es nicht sein soll im Silicon Valley, sind viele Auswirkungen der Pandemie tatsächlich an Frauen zu spüren. Die ähm, Arbeits-, also nicht Arbeitsrate der Frauen ist hier unglaublich hochgegangen in der Zeit der Pandemie. Wenn man sich entscheiden musste, wer bleibt zu Hause mit den Kindern, ist eben doch die klassische Rollenverteilung oft die Entscheidung, aber eben auch oft Wer verdient mehr? Und da sind wir immer noch nicht bei der Gendergleichheit. Und wenn man auch sagt, ja, alle, die diesen Job haben, verdienen gleich, wisst ihr, vielleicht ist es in Deutschland, aber auch in den USA so, dass es Jobs gibt oder dass es Arbeitsbereiche gibt, wo mehr Frauen arbeiten und die werden in der Regel schlechter bezahlt. Ich sage mal, auch in Deutschland wird noch eine Kindergärtnerin zum Beispiel deutlich schlechter bezahlt als ein Tierpfleger, Kindergärtnerin, klassischer Frauenberuf, Tierpfleger, klassischer Männerberuf. Also so eine Ungleichheiten gibt es einfach noch und solange ist es ganz wichtig, dass wir, wir darauf achten. Ich kann stolz sagen, dass meine Mutter für Frauenrechte sich eingesetzt hat und meine Tochter auch. Also ich bin hier immer in, in guter, sicherer Runde aufgewachsen und kann es auch selbst weitergeben und möchte euch unbedingt das weitergeben. Und deswegen ist es heute unser Thema. Und damit wir jetzt gleich inhaltlich losgehen, ähm, möchte ich nur noch einmal kurz unsere Außenministerin Frau Baerbock zitieren, die gesagt hat, Anlässlich des Frauentages, dass sie sich vor dem Mut der Frauen in der Ukraine verneigt. Und das ist sicher auch so ein Punkt, der heute eine Rolle spielt und den man heute nicht unerwähnt lassen kann, wenn man mitten in einem Krieg in Europa irgendwie steckt und ähm, den Internationalen Frauentag begeht. Jetzt übergebe ich aber an Frau Antonitsch äh, vom Konsulat. Frau Antonitsch. Thank you, Professor. Cool. And thank you also for remembering the, um, the war that's going on in the Ukraine. Um, and inviting me for the lecture today on the occasion of International Women's Day. And good morning, everyone. Um, I hear there's a lot of high school students here in the call. Um, I remember um, I took AP Biology and Global Politics when I was in high school. And um, the most annoying question anyone could ask, especially my parents, was, so what are you going to study? Who are you going to be? And um, Yeah, I couldn't have answered that question because the term science diplomacy didn't even exist back then. So today is International Women's Day and we celebrate women's achievements and their contributions to society through their work in science and technology, in politics, in the economy, in arts, in many other areas of cultural life. And this dedicated celebration day is important because, like Principal Rachel said, globally, the contribution to societies by women and girls in many of these areas have and continue to be undervalued and often even undermined, both de jure and de facto. By de jure, I mean existing laws, regulations, and policies. And of course, we know much progress has been made on gender equality, but still many nations, companies, academic institutions, 
even civil society organizations still have rules in place today that pose barriers to women's success. Now, there's a number of international initiatives to address this problem. Germany currently holds the presidency of the G7, that's the group of seven wealthiest economies in the world. And if you're interested in what women demand from the G7 forum in terms of gender equality, I encourage you to follow the Women's Seven Dialogue um, that will take place in May. Now, the G7 leaders met two weeks ago and stated their commitments to gender equality and also to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. And I like this, um, this uh, image from the UN SDGs because the G7 leaders did set themselves up to some targets, including to ensure women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership at all levels of decision making. And that brings me to what I mean by de facto norms. Those are existing cultural norms and perceptions on the abilities and role of women and girls. So that even where gender equality laws do exist, it is these cultural norms and perceptions that can still lead to unfair and discriminatory practices. And those make it harder for women and girls to participate in all these areas. So like Frau, Presch, uh, Frau Reschel noted, that means, for example, that these biases account for the gender pay gap. And right now in the US, among all workers, that means it's 16 cents to the dollar. So that when a man comes home with $100,000 a year, the woman only takes home $84,000 a year even though she has the same education and the same experience. And the same biases are also seen in funding opportunities. So over and over there have been tests. And when there's an application for project funding, it is more likely that it is approved if it's submitted by an applicant named John. And it's more likely to be declined if that funding application is submitted by an applicant named Jen. So, so we do need to change this. And to do that, it's really important to recognize the achievements by women past and present. And um, we need to highlight fundamentally and establish the norm transforming change that can happen in courts, but it also has to happen within our organizations. Um, we need to move away from agents of doubt and we need to move towards the empowerment of courage and trust, just like Frau Röschel acknowledged her mother giving it to her. And this requires us to reflect personally on our own behavior, our thoughts, our words, our actions, both with regards to ourselves and towards others. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to listen to Katharina Mandel share her personal reflections about her success in the field of computer sciences and entrepreneurship. And um, I just want to add, in fact, that the COVID crisis is a prime example of the science policy interface. And the Lu Luca app is an illustration of applying technological innovations to the implementation of policy objectives, such um, in this case, contact tracing in order to contain a pandemic. And it also illustrates the need, as with most technological advances, to secure against potential negative impacts on society. So for example, to ensure privacy protections and that can be done through data anonymization, um, as I understand, was implemented in the Luca app. So with this, I hand over back and um, welcome Katarina. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm going to uh, take over first. Thank, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Antonich 
um, from the German Consulate at San Francisco. We're honored to have you with us today, and we look forward to continuing our work with you and your colleagues in the upcoming months. And thank you, Katrin Ruschel and the GISSV team for the excellent collaboration and organization. Um, our invited speaker today, Katharina Mandel, grew up in Bensheim, a town in Hesse, Germany. And in 2017, she started studying for her bachelor's degree in IT systems engineering at the Hasso Plattner Institute in Potsdam. She's currently working towards her master's degree at HPI and has a scholarship from the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. Katharina joined Nexenio in November 2020 as a working student. And Nexenio, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a company that was founded by HPI alumni. And she is now the product owner for the Luca apps, which are used all over Germany for COVID contact tracing. And Luca has more than 40 million users. And Katarina will tell us more about Luca and herself. Katarina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think I'm going to start sharing. First of all, I have to make one remark uh, because of what uh, Katrin said. Actually, I have to say I'm not the inventor of the Luca app. I'm only product owner. <laughs> uh, maybe that's important. Uh, Impressive enough. Impressive enough, Katarina. <laughs> <laughs> uh, however, with that, I'm going to start sharing. So do you see my screen now? All right, nice. So first of all, uh, yeah, let's go to the next remark, actually, because uh, this, uh, as, as I can tell, is uh, for, yeah, it should be as interesting to you as uh, it can be and should not be about me overloading you with an information. So if you have any question, please do not hesitate also to ask in between or uh, to unmute yourself. And uh, if, if there's anything that you're more interested in, in um, compared to what I'm talking about, then uh, just please say so. So, but with that said, uh, I'm going to start now. So why I wanted to work in IT and ended up as product owner for one of Germany's most popular apps, the Luca app. So we're just introduced to Luca, but I'm going to introduce you to me now. I'm Katarina. I was born uh, in 1998 in a small town near Frankfurt, as Joanne already told you. And uh, I'm actually passionate about modern contemporary dancing and all kinds of endurance sports. And uh, actually, I had to laugh a little when I saw that slide because a, a colleague of mine was preparing the whole presentation. And uh, this is a little, yeah, let's say insider. Uh, because, uh, or that goes along with the third point that you can see here, uh, I do not like to be at one place for more than four weeks, which was actually quite hard uh, within the last one and a half years. However, uh, that is also one of the benefits uh, when working in IT, because, uh, for example, my parents uh, live at Majorca, so I spend a lot of time there, working from there, and um, yeah, this was uh, actually about two to three weeks ago when I was skiing in Switzerland uh, at a friend's place and also worked from there. So my colleagues really uh, rather, or I'm known actually for not being uh, in the office uh, at any time, <laughs> but uh, instead working from anywhere. Yes, but that's that, just a little uh, context about me. And actually now to the last point, I'm also passionate about fashion. And actually when I was about your age, uh, I was really sure that I wanted to study fashion management. However, then I did two internships at a designer in Germany and a fashion magazine. And I realized that I couldn't imagine working in fashion for my whole life. So I had to rethink and it was actually quite hard because um, I was in 12th grade, I think, back then. And until then, I was really, really sure that I wanted to work in fashion. And then I had to, um, yeah, kind of... Uh, yeah, completely rethink what I wanted to do. And actually, I can totally um, agree with what uh, Beate just said, that it's really um, hard to answer that question of what to study and who you want to be. And uh, yeah, back then I had a lot of talks with my dad who already uh, or also worked in, in IT. And he then told me about the HPI in and thus, uh, I yeah just went there uh, for a visit, and uh, because I like the campus and the city and everything there so much, I then decided just to study um, computer science out of the box, let's say, uh, because I didn't have um, computer science at school, and neither I had uh, 
like an advanced course in math or anything like that. But I just decided because I've always been tech savvy and uh, also quite good at math. Uh, and then, then I just decided to um, let's give it a try. And yeah, to, to try to study computer science and to understand actually the, um, yeah, the technical devices that we use every day. But so that you can also understand why I decided to do that. I'm going to show you one picture of the campus and uh, so that you know what I'm talking about. So actually that's one part of what made me study at HPI. Uh, as I said, the campus and also the city of Potsdam, which is really, really nice. So if you have the chance to go there, I would really recommend to do so. And I also had a chat with one professor that really, uh, yeah, stick to my mind even uh, until today, because uh, I was so, yeah, insecure uh, back then that I would be, or insecure if I would be um, able to study computer science without having any prior knowledge in that field. However, that professor told me that uh, that uh, isn't actually a problem and that many students do not have any prior knowledge and that they start from scratch really um, in the first semester. However, <laughs> I experienced that this was not really the case. So uh, actually uh, many of the students that started studying with me uh, already had a lot of prior knowledge um, when they started studying uh, computer science. Uh, so the first one or two semesters were really, really hard. I had to catch up with a lot of topics. However, I get to know some people who were really the minority with, who also didn't have too much of uh, prior knowledge. And with the right people, I can tell you, you can study almost everything and also uh, at the right place. It was really so after the, I would say, first or first two semesters uh, really went up like that. And it was uh, got really cool with cool people and also then with uh, like cooler topics because the first two semesters when studying computer science or I think any scientific topic is really theoretical. But uh, when you went uh, when you went past that point, so past every um, like basic math class or a theoretical computer science class or anything that um, <clears throat> goes into that, that direction and rather go into topics like how does internet work or um, yeah, how can you imagine uh, phones communicating and uh, really like the, what, what I regard of uh, like really interesting stuff because uh, as I said, these are things that we use every day and uh, you really a minority only knows how those work. So that's what uh, really got me interested in IT and actually kept me going uh, when studying at HPI because I was <laughs> really not sure about that within the first two semesters. So hint to you, uh, if you start studying next year or within the next years, you have to get past those first or first two semesters. Trust me, it will get better. And as I said, there were a lot of brains uh, yeah, within my fellow, stu fellow uh, students because uh, many of the people there had really a lot of prior, nor prior knowledge, had uh, experience in coding for almost 10 years. Uh, they were really, really, really good at what they're doing. And they were also really good in theoretic parts, like, as I said, theoretic computer science. Um, so, but what I actually uh, got to know then was that it's, uh, it's also important to communicate what you're doing and not only be really like, good in the uh, theoretical parts and that's actually where I found my sweet spot but I'm going to tell you um, a little more about that later. Uh, maybe uh, what's also important so I <laughs> got, um, called this slide studying at HPI what also has to be said so as I said it's a computer science institute and that, that shouldn't be new to you However, there are really only people studying computer science and there are a lot of prejudices. And I can tell you that a lot of them are true about people studying computer science, but not all of them. And uh, <laughs> within the people for whom those do not apply that much, we also do party and we have a really, really nice uh, campus culture at HPI, I have to say that. Um, because actually, that's not really what I expected when I started uh, studying computer science and being surrounded by only computer scientists all the time. 
And uh, as I said, the campus culture was really nice. So we had Friday beers every Friday after um, after our lectures. And we have this uh, HPI Sommerfest uh, from which uh, this picture is. And yeah, many, many, many different things where you can get to know really like everybody and everybody at HPI knows everybody. Uh, and actually that, uh, I think it's rather an American thing. So maybe it's natural to you that there's such campus life, but actually it's not that natural in Germany. So I think it's important to mention that uh, here as well when talking about uh, studying in HPI. But as I said to you, I'm not like the best coder and neither I'm the best at computer uh, or uh, theoretical computer science. However, um, that one thing that I or that the special about me, I think, at HPI was that I can communicate uh, the things that we were doing. So the complex concepts and uh, yeah, talking about what we do um, every day in, in those topics. And when I recognized that I was good at it and that that was something special because I didn't really think of that as something special, I started to work uh, for the HPI um, blog, uh, which was a blog um, that went to events or so digital uh, fairs or events like that and also to the digital Gipfel, which is like the most uh, important fair for politicians and um, companies uh, regarding digitalization in germany and we went there with a blog and interviews the most important politicians founders scientists uh, in germany and thus I yeah, got the chance to really get to know a lot of interesting uh, people through HPI. Uh, and yes, also the chance to be at those events because they were really, really cool. And as yeah, the, the people at HPI also got aware of that, uh, I started to moderate uh, all of, of the HPI events actually. So what you can see here is uh, the 20 year celebration that was i think in 2018 so already or 2019 i guess so already some time ago but that was also really really cool and uh yes uh, this uh, actually also th this opportunity also brought me to nexenio because that happened back then this is a picture of the bachelor podium that we have once a year at hpi where uh, actually every so we have uh, within the last two semesters of the of the studies at HPI. I, I'm not sure if you know that, but I'm just I just repeat it so that we're all on the same page. So within the last two semesters of HPI, we have a big uh, computer science project with uh, companies and also with chairs from HPI. And uh, so you work on on a project with five to six uh, fellow students. And then at the end of the project, you uh, present um, the results from that project. And that's um, uh, the results are presented within the bachelor podium once a year. And uh, actually, that was the first online bachelor podium because it was already in times of um, COVID-19 and measures. So we weren't able to do that uh, live or like in person. But we did it online uh, as a live event and thus they needed also someone moderating the event. And uh, actually next to um, Meinl that you can see on the right hand side here. And actually I've seen that he's also already talked in this uh, series. So you should be aware of him. Um, and actually I was quite nervous standing there. <laughs> I, I think you can tell that from the picture. <laughs> but yes, I had the chance to moderate uh, like right next to him. And uh, within that event, um, also one, or actually the, the head of sales of Nexenio joined and thus uh, saw me moderating and afterwards uh, texted me on LinkedIn uh, if I wanted to work at Nexenio as a working student. Um, so actually that was like really the first time um, they got aware of me. And I already uh, knew Nexenio because a lot of my friends from HPI already work there. So I was really excited that um, somebody from there texted me asking me if I wanted to work there and uh, obviously said yes, <laughs> because uh, yeah, now I, I work at Nexenio, but um, maybe some context about Nexenio as well. So um, <clears throat> Nexenio actually is a startup uh, in Berlin, so right, right like in the middle of Berlin, as you can see here, and uh, right, right at Friedrichstraße actually. And it was founded in 2015 by Patrick Hennig 
and Philip Berger, and also with Professor Meinl that you just uh, saw on the on the picture beforehand. And uh, actually, the uh, Nexenia was founded based on different projects or research projects from within HPI that um, yeah, were done by Philip and Patrick. And uh, what they so the, they worked a long time uh, in research at HPI. However, what they lacked was um, yeah, the possibility to put the the project that they worked on really into products and really do something with it um, beyond this uh, let's say only researching. And actually, that's um, what makes Nexenio. So uh, all of the products that are now. Um, developed within Nexenio are former research projects, except from Luca, <laughs> but more to that later. And uh, yeah, that, that's kind of the cool thing because it's a really, that's really a strong connection to the HPI still. And thus also a, a lot of my colleagues here at Nexenio are still studying at HPI or also studied at, at HPI. But now to the products of Nexenio. We have, uh, or b before, or when I joined, actually, we have three products, uh, Nextboard, B-Drive, and Seamless. Nextboard being a virtual whiteboard, B-Drive, um, a secure file sharing system, so like Dropbox in Safe, let's say, and Seamless, which is contactless uh, authentic authentication, uh, which means, uh, like, basically, uh, actually, yeah, be let's say behavior-based uh, authentication, meaning that um, yeah, you are re registered on your cell phone and your cell phone um, um, through sensors um, can tell how you move. And whenever you want to go through a gate and the cell phone recognizes that there is a gate and recognizes that you are really the person that is locked in on your phone, then the gate will open automatically without you having to um, get a key or anything. It will just open by with you walking through that gate and having your cell phone nearby. And actually, besides the products and that it's cool that they are research projects, uh, there are also other uh, advantages coming from working in a startup. So first of all, as you can see, we have a really nice office and I have actually some more <laughs> nice pictures in here. So we, I really do love the office and I can already see actually from here colleagues of mine sitting next to me on the rooftop terrace and having some wine so <laughs> the atmosphere is really cool here and uh, it's really a, a super young team a super cool team a lot of uh, colleagues have have gotten friends of mine we all also went on vacation together so it's really it rather feels like working on a project with friends i really have to tell it i, I mean it sounds uh, a little off but it really is like that and as I said, we have uh, yeah, super nice office, super nice views, and uh, the most important, super nice team. And it's really nice to also celebrate um, you know, within that team. However, uh, next to the products that I already told you about, and now I think to the more interesting part, uh, now to the Luca app. How it all started, uh, how it developed, and uh, yeah, what, what we uh, figured to do with that let's say like that. So actually uh, the context of Luca or how it started was that, um, yeah, we had to, so because of COVID-19, there were different measures in place. And one of them was um, contact tracing, which was done completely with pen and paper in Germany. So really, uh, whenever you went to a restaurant, you had to put your name and contact data on a piece of paper. And then you had those stacks of papers at every restaurant, at every bar, um, that were then or should be then uh, gone through by the health departments uh, as soon as somebody got tested positive who went to that place beforehand, which uh, you may reckon uh, also is really unrealistic. So I'm not sure if any health department ever went through one of those stacks, to be honest. However, uh, the measures that were um, taken also regarding, so for example, how many people are allowed to go to a restaurant or to a bar or uh, how long uh, the restaurant or bars may have opened or anything, um, any other measure actually was based on the capacity of health departments. And that's the problem with that. If we have um, contact tracing in place uh, and uh, actually naturally uh, overloading health departments, because if you imagine one 
person being tested positive and having been at, uh, let's say, 10 locations within the last 14 days, if the health department has to go to every restaurant or bar or whatever uh, the person has uh, been to and go through all of the stacks that are not sorted and not uh, like uh, ordered by <clears throat> ordered by the time the, the um, people went there, uh, I think it's really unrealistic that health departments uh, can keep up with their normal work and uh, that we can really like contain the pandemic in that way. And so we thought that we would have to do that, uh, that a little better <laughs> or uh, way better and at least uh, give the health departments a way to have a chance to get onto all that work. And actually, as I said, it wasn't my idea, <laughs> but uh, it was Patrick's idea uh, together with um, different people, uh, one of them being uh, Markus Trojan, so uh, a club owner actually in Germany and in, in Berlin. Uh, because he said that he wasn't really able to open his club even in the summertime of 2020, even when the, the numbers were really low. However, uh, that was, uh, as I said, the measures were based on the health departments being overloaded. So he said that uh, this can't be the case and that there must be some way to make it better. And that's actually how Luca came up. So, um, yes, uh, we started with the concept for checking in and to actually automatically share the data of people going to places and checking in with the health departments. And that actually is, I think, something that made us special because, as you can imagine, we were not the only one having the idea of uh, making this whole topic of contact tracing digital. Actually, there were a lot of apps trying to do the same. But what we tried to do was not only the checking in part and not only uh, let's say the connection between uh, the users checking in and the location so for example the restaurants but also connecting those two with the health departments in a secure way so um, this is actually the whole luca system so uh, many people think that luca only um, only includes the app however uh, it is it includes um, yeah like uh, the whole system with health departments and luca locations and with that, um, we yeah, started the whole <laughs> topic and went on with working on the app with the mission to experience life together. And uh, continued working on the app, as I said, and when, uh, when we have yeah, like the, the core uh, functionality in place, we, uh, fu we focused on also improving the UX for the people so that they would also uh, like to lose like to use Luca and not only use it because they had to because of, uh, as I said, the um, COVID tracing, um, contact tracing measures. And when we started doing that, actually one, uh, one person got uh, aware of us too, and that was Smudo. And actually uh, I was told, because in Germany, everybody knows Smudo. Um, and I was told the last days uh, that uh, he's so popular because he made rap music in Germany popular. Uh, actually, I, di I didn't know that beforehand, but I know that many people know Smudo and uh, more importantly, know Fanta Fear, which is his group. So they made a lot of uh, music, I, I think maybe 20 years ago. So especially the older generation knows him really, really well. And uh, that was like really cool because uh, that uh, yeah, thus we could gain some trust also within the older generation that was not too keen on using uh, digital solutions for, uh, for example, contact tracing. And uh, it was quite nice because everybody had him in mind and uh, also the group Fanta Fear and not only the, the whole Corona topic, which was also nice to have a, a positive um, mind towards an app like Luca and not always this um, yeah, negative mindset. And what happened when he joined or he uh, supported us was actually that. Uh, this is uh, a German TV show uh, that uh, took place at the end of 2020. Um, and back then we had our first peak in users. Uh, and actually we, we got to, I think, about 1,000, uh, which sounds like really not a lot <laughs> right now. 
but uh, back then it was really like huge to us because when we started building Luca, we weren't really sure if anybody would uh, ever use it because as I told you, there were a lot of apps uh, in place that tried to do anything similar to us. And uh, we were really not sure if it would work out in any way. However, it, it kind of did <laughs> in the end. So what we do then uh, was to uh, continue developing Luca and uh, also to get more people into the team uh, also to add more functionality not only to check in with Luca but also to for example add the vaccination certificates and also tests within the app and uh, yeah on all to make it easier also for restaurants to use the app so not only um, for the people to check in but also really to um, support the restaurants that have already suffered a lot from the measures um, uh, due to the COVID crisis. Uh, so we really wanted to support them uh, wherever we could. Uh, and thus, the last point here already says it in March 2021. And that's what was actually, I still remember the day when um, we got to know about that. And we were here also in the office and uh, Patrick came to us and uh, was like, completely overwhelmed uh, when they signed the contracts because um, as it states here 13 of 16 states decided to use Luca for contact tracing and they uh, almost all simultaneously decided to um, decided to use Luca and that's uh, like yeah that was really crazy to us because when the states decided to fund Luca and uh, thus or, or not, not really to fund but actually to buy licenses so that uh, the health departments were able to use it uh, that was the point where we were really sure that it our idea our crazy ideas had worked out so um yeah maybe to that and then uh, as i said we just continued working on that continued uh, simplifying everything for for restaurants, locations, and try their best in yeah, making the best out of the not that nice situation. And uh, what happened then actually was uh, really crazy. Everywhere we went, we saw Luca codes. So at, um, at my favorite club, uh, at the dance studio, at the wine festival in my hometown, uh, at every Starbucks, really like, you, we can't imagine that, but everywhere I went, there was a Luca QR code. And it felt really, really crazy because, I mean, we, I, I knew the numbers back then, how many users we had and also how many locations, but it still felt like we were working on a project with friends within the office here in Berlin and uh, not like really people were using it out of our office, our scope, let's say. And um, yeah, when I first went to my hometown after uh, having worked here for uh, quite some time and saw these QR codes everywhere, it was really like completely crazy. And uh, then also, uh, having talked about the numbers, uh, we got up to uh, 40 million users, which is also really crazy. Um, I mean, maybe that sounds not too much to you, but actually that's half of Germany. So it was really completely crazy for us. It was really absurd. And we also had 450,000 uh, locations signing in uh, to Luca and 30, uh, 323 health departments of approximately 370 health departments were connected to the system. So as I said, uh, 13 of our 16 federal states decided to use Luca and with them uh, also all the health departments within that states um, got connected to Luca. However, we also provided the uh, possibility for those uh, health departments in the States that do not decide to use, to use Luca uh, to still connect. And thus we have uh, some more health departments. So also some um, single health departments that decided to um, buy the licenses and use Luca. Um, yes, and actually I, I don't have a feeling or I don't have a number of how many locations we have in Germany. Uh, so I, I can't really give you a number of, or kind of give you a context of how many locations that are in contrast to all locations that we have but I can tell you really almost wherever you go there are Luca codes everywhere and with that um, kind of development also people got let's say interested in what I did at Luca 
And uh, due to that, I was invited to uh, different talks uh, to have live discussions uh, from, for example, the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung. I'm going to show you a um, screenshot of that in a second. Um, but uh, yeah, that was also like really, really new to me because, uh, as I said, I started working at Nexenio as a working student and hasn't worked as uh, anything within that product uh, topic beforehand and uh, also didn't know actually what was expecting me when Patrick asked me if I wanted to uh, help in product and then uh, became product owner of the native apps of, of Luca. And yeah, then suddenly I was uh, responsible for, yeah, to keep 40 million users happy. That was really a crazy, like, uh, experience um, made back then. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure actually if you know about the, the role of a PO or what a PO, um, so product owner does. Um, actually, in the most times when somebody asks me what I'm doing is to tell the developers what to do. <laughs> because uh, as I've told you before, I'm not the best coder and uh, I also don't have to uh, like hide that, but uh, I think I'm, I'm quite good at understanding the concept of a product or of a technical product and to communicate um, like the, the, the vision and also to communicate what has to be done so that we reach um, or that we go, come through the product that uh, we have in mind. And uh, that's really is uh, like, let's say, 80% of my time is really um, writing tickets and uh, organizing developers um, doing what uh, Patrick and me had in mind for Luca. And uh, the other time I'm, uh, yeah, let's say, working as, a, as an interface, interface for all people that have to do anything with the, pro with the product. So, for example, our designers or marketing or PR. So anything actually that has to do with the product, if they have any question uh, regarding the apps, they would go to me and I would try to explain uh, what we're working on and try to help anybody out who has any questions. Yes, and uh, within that role, actually, it was uh, also a little, um, a little crazy. That discussion I, I just told you about uh, was for the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung, as I said, and a week before that discussion started. So I asked uh, our PR person if it, if it would be fine, because um, actually the, the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung asked me to do uh, that discussion. And a week before that, I learned that Jan Kuhs, so within the, the lower right here, would be also part of it. And uh, actually just some days um, before that, I learned that he was like our one of our biggest competitors. And uh, thus I had to really like stand against everything that he said within that uh, discussion as uh, only the product owner um, compared to him as uh, the founder of another um, app for that contact tracing topic. Uh, I was also like re really, really excited before that session, uh, but it was also a, a nice experience. Okay, no, no, not, <laughs> let's not say nice experience, but it was an experience uh, to have uh, been part of such a discussion and to really uh, stand against every bad feedback, but also explain why we did uh, things the way we did because um, actually, we are also aware that um, the whole Luca system, I mean, it is quite secure. However, it's uh, probably not the system that we would have built if we would have like months or years of time uh, thinking about how uh, such a system could look like and then building it. But what we did back then was really okay. There is this problem in place. We have to make anything um, and we have to yeah, m make an effort to uh, digitalize where we can and thus um, support health departments. So we just started implementing and we're uh, yeah, still trying to get rid of that um, approach, I think. Uh, so now we have to learn uh, to really first think about what we're doing, but I'm com coming to that uh, also in a second. But um, yes, as I said, uh, the most important thing that was to really get, get, hands, get our hands dirty, do anything and then see if it works out and if it doesn't uh, try again and uh, do things differently but um, really the focus was on speed here so uh, some of the criticism uh, also was actually completely understandable so uh, I also learned uh, within that time and especially in discussions like that 
um, to cope with that criticism and to also um, give in that we didn't do anything perfect, uh, but that we tried our best and that we're still trying to. And um, yes, so these kind of situations uh, really like having to stand in for the product that you're building all of the time that feels like your baby it was also really, it, it was an experience, I would say. But now to sum up actually the, the Luca star story, uh, you have, uh, or I, I will provide you with a timeline here because I know that it's a lot of context and I just wanted to uh, give you the opportunity to have some kind of uh, summary over here as well. So as I said, in, in summer 2020, we started with the idea of uh, the club owner in Berlin and uh, Patrick also. And uh, in, in September 2020, the app was available for download for the first time. And then uh, some months later, uh, also after the appearance on Tagesschau in Germany, um, it was the date when 30 federal states decided to use Luca and sign those contracts to buy the license. Uh, within April, oh, that was also a crazy time now thinking about it, uh, we went open source because that was uh, actually, uh, yeah, many people asked for the code and uh, for us to go open source. And uh, yeah, as you may imagine, uh, and as I already said, we had to do things really, really fast. So none of us were really prepared to go open source with the code. Um, the developers weren't like really uh, <laughs> happy with the code. Um, except from, so everything was functioning, but the code was not ready to go open source. So we also had to, um, yeah, make a lot of efforts so that uh, we could open source the code, but also everything uh, went well, uh, even if the developers didn't really expect everything to went well back then. Um, but uh, yeah, then uh, shortly afterwards, uh, we got the first 10 million users, which we also celebrated like really hard because the uh, 10 million was also like really a lot to us. Sounds a little crazy uh, compared to 40 million uh, now, but I think that's like really completely beyond everything that we could have imagined um, back then. Uh, then within September, we um, yeah made uh, Luca Plus or also Luca 2.0, uh, so the, the next bigger version of Luca, adding a lot of functionality to support the health departments again because um, in, in September or October it was, um, uh, it could have been foreseen that it, the whole situation uh, or Corona situation went uh, worse again, so we had to really uh, focus on um, on really supporting uh, health departments again and giving them a little more uh, possibilities to um, do contact tracing and also to warn people. Um, yeah, based on the feedback that we've got um, within the couple of mon months beforehand. Because um, maybe also as a context for you, up until March 2021, almost every restaurant uh, and every location that you could check in via Luca was closed. So um, up until then, uh, nobody actually like really could use Luca because uh, there was no uh, no place where you could go to where you could check in. So um, uh, we actually started like getting feedback within March, and that's also why we have uh, this really peak of users um, users there. And uh, then we have the the summer months that were quite um, not really quiet but uh, rather quiet. Uh, and then uh, when it went, when we went back to winter, we could already um, implement some of the feedback that we've got until then by the health departments and also by locations. And that's why we uh, built Luca Plus. And actually the, the picture that I showed you beforehand with a partying team, that was the um, party for the Luca Plus release. So also for you to know, uh, because we, we worked really weeks um, for that release, uh, which was uh, really a lot for us back then, because uh, um, in the other times we uh, tried to release very fast and very small parts, but then we decided to do one big release with uh, a smaller redesign and, as I said, also uh, many functionalities or added functionalities for the health departments. However, uh, then going to the, uh, or rather, yeah, going farther uh, within, uh, to, towards winter actually. So in November, 
we decided uh, also to focus more on the um, locations, so operators here, so like restaurants, bars, um, etc. And we decided to uh, launch a whole new mobile app for them. So because it's, it's also possible to um, actively check somebody in uh, as an operator, as a, a restaurant owner, for example, and also to actively check for the 2G, 3G roles. And we wanted to make that a little easier for the people uh, working in restaurants. And that's why we, um, yes, also wanted to launch a, a mobile app um, especially for them. And then, as I said, at the end of 2021, we reached the 14 million users. Um, and yes, we will see how it will continue. Uh, and we will definitely be continuing to work on, on Luca. But first, to the learnings and challenges uh, that we had through the last, uh, let's say, one and a half years, almost two years, actually. Um, because, as I already said, we already uh, or we, we also did uh, some mistakes, and uh, but more importantly, we really made a lot of experiences. And I, I really think that within the last one and a half years, I've learned more than in my entire study. Um, sorry, HPI at that point, <laughs> but really this learning curve as um, PO for such a big topic is, um, yeah, it can't be compared to any study that you can make. So I want to share some of those insights to you because I also heard that uh, some of you are also interested in entrepreneurship. So um, maybe, um, yes, to the first one, measures can change every day. Plans beyond <laughs> one more week rarely remain. And that's actually specific to our situation because uh, as you can imagine, I, I mean, I'm not really sure how that was in, um, in the United States. But uh, in Germany, really, those measures that we had to um, yeah, for, for the pandemic really changed like every day. And I'm, I'm not sure if that um, if everybody in uh, Germany also was aware of, aware of that, because also a lot of my friends uh, just uh, stopped checking on the measures uh, sometime because they were uh, changing that frequently. Uh, however, we at Luca were not able to uh, just uh, <laughs> like ignore the changes every day because we had to integrate everything into our app and thus um, most of the times we had to uh, really like replan and replan and replan and um, because we couldn't really rely on the measures staying the same all the time and it also really like didn't work out that measures stayed the same so uh, i have um, maybe one short story i have one uh, or an, a meeting every monday with the app developers uh, trying to tell them uh, a little bit of the context and what we're planning to do and what we will do this week. And uh, actually, it, it got also an insider joke that I uh, present a roadmap, but that I present a new roadmap every week. <laughs> so uh, it was really, really hard to plan. However, we had to remain flexible in order to uh, like really have the people, have the restaurants uh, in uh, also implementing the rules that they were um, that, that they had to and yeah thus we just had to um, kind of um, yeah deal with the situation and that's why uh, one of our learnings uh, or challenges was uh, was those um, measures changing really from day to day and that also uh, goes together with the second point I have in here in exceptional situations like these, doing is more important than thinking. And that's also what I, um, I kind of teased it uh, beforehand, uh, because we weren't able to really like think month or even weeks uh, about how we wanted to build uh, specific features or also the whole system. We just had to do anything to really help within that situation. And uh, that's yeah why I think that the whole implementation of Luca can be um, yeah, summarized within those two words, doing overthinking, or three words actually, uh, because yeah, as I said, speed was like the most important thing um, back then. Um, and that then again, uh, goes together well with the next point, team matters, and 90% of my time allocated to keep keeping my team uh, motivated, because doing overthinking is, really exhausting 
over time. And it's really hard to keep people motivated to work on something that changes every day or, or when, when the plans change every day because uh, our developers actually had to redo uh, a lot of things because uh, we weren't able to stick to the plans that we had. So when they started, for example, working on a feature, but then the government decided to change the measures. So we had to uh, adjust the requirements for the feature. They had to redo some parts of that. Thus, um, yeah, a, a lot of, yeah, a big part of my job was to really keep people motivated and uh, keep sticking to to the mission that we had uh, and not focusing too much on uh, yeah, the, the lack of planning that we had, which was also hard uh, actually in times so that also has to be said in here. Uh, but nevertheless, we had and still have a really cool team and that also facilitated the whole um, process within the last uh, one and a half years because when you have a nice mission and also a cool team almost anything else doesn't matter actually at least uh, to my mind and the last point in here where with that amount of users you get instant feedback especially when something is not working properly so we had to experience that also uh, over and over again we have a lot of users and every time when i released an app that was was not working properly uh, Twitter uh, almost instantly uh, told me so <laughs> that uh, the app was not working and uh, thus Patrick and me had a lot of long weekends trying to uh, fix whatever was wrong when the developers weren't there and we uh, again and again why ever released on a Friday night uh, because we wanted to get the, the feature out and anything did not work then um, yes we, we got as I said instant feedback and uh, yeah, however, we're then um, also most of the times able to like get rid of the, the bugs quite fast. <laughs> yes, and then with that, actually, actually that's um, the, I think the most important learnings and challenges we have. Actually, but I have one more. It's also very nice and important to have the right connections to get everything going. I think we, we also have to mention that here. As I said, uh, Fandafir, who are really supporting us and really uh, getting a lot of connections also. And uh, due to them, we also got um, a lot of awareness. And also Marcus, who had uh, together with Patrick the idea to set this whole thing up. So yes, I think it also has to be mentioned here that the connections that we have definitely also added uh, awareness uh, to the whole product. And with that said, uh, thanks, first of all, for listening and sorry for the long monologue. <laughs> I hope that there have been uh, some interesting points for you. Nevertheless, I'm more than open for questions and uh, yeah, can hopefully um, still tell you some more interesting stories if you would like to hear them. Dann sage ich erstmal danke.